today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I wrote a sticky note and put it on my computer that says, be the sponge. There are some school-specific sponsorships which make you feel like more inclined towards them. While you're an MBA, you have an unprecedented access to a lot of people. Be it alums, recruiters, so your professors, your career services. Make the most out of your time, talk to people, get a clear understanding of what you want to go into. Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's happening. We're here to talk about hard, critical reasoning questions. Um, everybody hopefully saw that exciting video for the MBA Fair. It is coming June 13th and 14th to GMAT Club. Go to gmatclub.com, and you'll see the button right away to say to register now. Do it. Everybody's going to be there. Manhattan Prep, we're going to be there. MBA Mission's going to be there. Top 25 schools including the entire M7, will be there. You could be there too. Think about it. Be there. All right. Welcome. Hello, Akshita. Um, guys, as this session goes on, when questions come to mind, put them in the chat window. I'll probably answer them in line. If not, I'll try to answer them at the end and save a little bit of time for Q&A at the end as well. But it tends to work out better when you ask a question when it comes to mind, especially if it's relevant to what's on screen. Right now, probably no questions about what's on screen, but that's all about to change. Get ready, you guys, as we talk about how to ace hard critical reasoning questions, some of the advanced tactics in critical reasoning. Here goes. These are the things we're gonna be talking about, okay? Prephrasing, which is kind of a standard CR practice, but often misunderstood. Some people go a bit too small and just say, I need to weaken the question. Some people go a bit too big and try to think about very specific scenarios that will weaken the argument. I'm gonna advocate the Goldilocks approach. Somewhere in the middle of those two is often just right for a lot of people. It prepares you better than just saying, I wanna weaken the argument, um, but it doesn't require as much time or luck as predicting a specific thing, okay? So prephrasing where we're starting. We're gonna talk about answer choice analysis on the back ends. There's a lot of talk about process of elimination and how useful it can be in critical reasoning. We'll basically talk about how that process works broken down into smaller pieces, as well as some of the common trap answer types and the importance of naming those types, recognizing those types when you're reviewing critical reasoning questions. Negation tests, a lot of people probably know about it. We'll just get some experience using it in Find the assumption questions, which are, of course, among the hardest critical reasoning questions out there. Double moves, mystery title. We'll see when we get there. But basically, double moves are one of the ways they can make strength and weaken and assumption questions just that much harder. They tend to show up in very high level questions. And then hard boldface questions toward the end. What to do with those hard boldface questions, what skills they're testing, etc. All right. Ideally, you come away from this knowing basically how to prepare yourself better to go into the answer choices, how to deal with the answer choices better, and how to review questions in a way that's based on those answer choices. The answer choices are a lot of your success in critical reasoning, and the better you get to know them, the better you will do, okay? <clears throat> with that, and without further ado, let's begin. And indeed, practicing does make it perfect, all right? We're going to start with prephrasing. As Rahul says, practice makes it perfect. Let's get some practice. Take a minute here. Read this argument along with the prompts below it. Okay, now, one thing I think it's important to say up front, you know your island's in trouble when mongooses are your only remedy. When mongooses are your best plan, just hang it up, find a new island. But either way, mongooses are coming. Let's talk about prephrasing. First thing in prephrasing, just ID the question type. What kind of question are we dealing with? This is 
pretty much a weakened question. Now, it's a little bit misleading because it asks you to provide the most support for something, but that something that you're providing the most support for is kind of the opposite of what the arguments put out there, right? Support for the idea that the government's plan will fail, will utterly fail, all right? And that is essentially what a weakened question will ask you to do. Whatever the conclusion of an argument is, your right answer on a weakened question will support the opposite of that conclusion, okay? So, very much a weakened question. Next, you've got to really specify what conclusion you want to weaken. A lot of trap answers in critical reasoning, and again, especially in hard critical reasoning questions, are trap answers that feel really right because they respond to a conclusion that wasn't quite the conclusion stated in the argument, but that kind of feels like it was the conclusion stated in the argument or feels like it captures the gist of the argument or it's where the argument was leading. It is very important to be specific about the conclusion you want to strengthen, weaken, etc. Even in find the assumption questions, you've got to really respect the exact conclusion. Now, oftentimes that conclusion is in the argument itself, but every now and then with a longer prompt, a prompt that mentions some specifics from the argument, you treat information in the prompt as the conclusion. In this case, the prompt kind of specifies that we want to support the prediction that the plan will not have its intended effect, right? And we need to fill in those blanks. What is the plan? Got to bring those mongooses to the island. What's its intended effect? Got to curb the rat problem, right? And our goal here is to weaken the idea that this plan to bring the mongooses to the island will curb the rat problem. Now's when the prephrasing really happens, because that's where a lot of people will stop or just stop at, OK, we got to weaken this plan or something like that. That's probably not specific enough to be useful to you, nor do we have to come up with a specific reason when prephrasing why that plan is not going to work, like mongooses are lazy or something like that. There are too many possibilities here to make that a really practical approach, right? So instead, the middle ground. Say what you want an answer to accomplish in the terms of the conclusion, in the terms of the argument, all right? In this case, we want an answer that basically means importing the mongooses will not solve the rat problem, all right? Importing mongooses won't do the trick. Um, Puja, to answer your question, is pre-thinking important? I would say yes. I don't think it should be an extensive pre-think. Like, ideally, you'd get this process down to about a... 10, 20 second process, right? You're going to have to recognize the conclusion of the argument to have any hope in the answer choices anyway, right? That's just part of how you read and break down a critical reasoning argument. So that's already happening. You're going to have to acknowledge the question type you're dealing with as well, right? That's, again, already part of the process. So all I'm really advocating here is that you take an extra 10 seconds or so and phrase what you want an answer to accomplish in terms of those two things, the conclusion and what you're trying to do. Phrase it kind of positively, and if you are a note taker, write this prephrase down on your scratch paper. Notice it's not very specific. It just reminds you of what you want an answer to accomplish in a way that's more direct, because the danger otherwise is you go into the answers thinking, okay, does this weaken the argument? Does this weaken the argument? And that's actually your mind doing two things. You're gonna have to, three things even, you're gonna have to think, what was the argument again in the back of your mind? What would weakening the argument mean in the back of your mind? And also, does this answer do that job? Prephrasing in this way for just what a weakener to the argument would actually entail basically takes two of those steps away and puts you in a position to judge the answer choices immediately against this prephrase. All right. As long as you keep in mind, I want an answer that says importing mongooses will not solve the rat problem. It won't say that exactly. It'll give you a reason to believe that that's the case. You've cut out a lot of the actually difficult background processing that you're asking of your mind a lot if you go in without a prephrase. So yeah, I'm in favor of it. You don't necessarily need to write it down, um, but it does take a lot of the mental burden off and so make it a little more obvious which answers are doing the job, which again is really important in hard questions where the GMAT seeks to try to turn you around about what it is you're trying to get an answer choice to do. All right. Um, so you want to like break down the premise and the conclusion of the argument, Puja, of course, every time, but pre-thinking a little bit about what you want the answer to accomplish is what we're, we're talking about here. It's what I'm advocating and it helps. It helps a lot. To it. Take a look at these answer choices. And again, remind yourself of the goal of an answer. You want a goal 
that supports the idea that importing mongooses will not solve the rat problem. All right, effectively, you've turned what is a weakened question into a bit of a strengthener. You want an answer that strengthens this kind of opposite conclusion. Um, and again, it takes some of the background processing away. Take a look at these answers. And if you're feeling bold, say in the chat window, which one you prefer. Answers are coming in. Excellent. I see now that some of you are feeling bold. And that's exactly what we're here for. Get those answers in. Don't leave Carolyn Sahil alone on this one. Back them up. Agree with them. Disagree with them. Carol's got some backup. Love that. A lot of backup. Good. Excellent. Keep those answers coming if there are any more to put out there. Cool. Another A out there. An E? Unexpectedly. But B seems to be emerging as our favorite answer. All right. Another E. Cool. Excellent. And do keep them coming because I'm not going to reveal the answer just yet. All right. You're going to have to hold on to these answers for a second as we talk about a back-end skill. So what we talked about just then was prephrasing, something you do from the argument itself before you see the answer choices. And now we're going to talk. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Carol, you're not wrong. Like, part of the reason this question was chosen is that a lot of the answers seem pretty convincing, right? You can kind of make them work. All right. Especially, it looks like, B. Very popular answer. All right. Let's talk a little bit of answer choice analysis as we're breaking this down. So answer choice analysis starts by acknowledging what the new information is in the answer choices. Ooh, Karthik making a strong case for E. Love it. Um, and look, you've convinced Arjun. Uh, maybe, or maybe Arjun was already thinking that. We'll never know. Either way, judge answers by their new information. I've highlighted that new information in blue here, right? A's talking about the number of mongooses, which is kind of new. We never really got into the weeds about how many mongooses we would need to import or we would be importing. We don't know what the plan says about the number of mongooses, but A speaks to that. Maybe that's the key missing information, right? Because it's the job of an answer in a strength and weaken question, even really in find the assumption and evaluate the argument, to supply key new information <clears throat> that the argument itself left out, right? All right. Now, A also talks about this year, right? And remember, we want an answer that means importing the mongooses will not solve the rat problem. A kind of suggests that importing the mongooses will not solve the rat problem this year. But is that this year really necessary? Is it salient to the argument? That's how you have to judge new information, right? It's really tempting to look at a lot of answers and say, ah, oh, they're all out of scope, right? This is all new information, but not so. One of these pieces of new information will connect to some key part of the argument and produce the desired effect. Still, you're judging answers based on their new information. They're all going to contain nuggets of truth, little buzzwords from the argument. You want to see what's said around those nuggets of truth, right? So A's big liability right now is this year. Right? What about this year? In B, we've got its natural habitat mentioned, right? The mongooses are presumably coming to a habitat that's not their natural habitat in coming to the island of Tomi. And we find out that they feed on rodents somewhat smaller than rats, right? Which, I know, kind of suggests maybe they're not going to be suited to feed on these rats. And indeed, maybe they're not. We shall see. See, recent polls have shown the public. The public is suddenly coming into this picture in C, right? And we know the public's against the proposal. Though I noticed that C did not convince anybody. And 
probably rightly so, right? D's new thing is poison traps and how they're more efficient than <laughs> bringing mongooses onto the island. Hard to imagine, but maybe. Um, and E's new thing is, again, native habitat, right? Which is kind of a callback to what B was talking about, the natural habitat. And then dawn to dusk, the timeline of the mongooses hunting and feeding. All right. So the question is, which of these new pieces of information touches on stuff in the argument? All right. We already talked about how an A this year maybe doesn't do that, right? The proposal never really mentions a timeline, just says we're going to curb the rat problem if we bring mongooses in. It could have meant curb the rat problem over the next 12 years. It was never really contingent on curbing the rat problem entirely in this year, right? And so A's new information doesn't really weaken the conclusion or the plan at all because the plan wasn't contingent on a timeline. Again, an answer choice lives or dies by its new information and that new information's connection to the argument. Okay. Now we get to our most popular answer, B. The mongoose feeds on rodents somewhat smaller than rats. Now that's tempting because, again, it calls into question, will the mongoose even be able to eat these rats if we bring it to the island, or are the rats going to be too mighty to take it on? They're already taking on humans, these rats are, so maybe the mongoose doesn't stand a chance. But notice, there's a lot of maybe in that, right? It is, of course, entirely possible that rodents somewhat smaller than rats are all that are on the island that serves as the mongoose's natural habitat, right? Or it could be that given a choice, the mongoose would prefer rodents somewhat smaller than rats, but if rats are all the mongoose has, the mongoose will happily eat rats, right? There are some maybes here, which makes be a tenuous answer. It could absolutely serve as the weakener in the absence of an answer that's more directly related to something the argument said. But taking it to its natural habitat and talking about what the mongoose generally feeds on in that natural habitat doesn't necessarily imply anything about whether the mongoose can feed on rats itself. So B, you're on the bubble. C, of course, public is solidly against the proposal. I have a lot to say about that, but essentially, look, there is no mention of the public here. Nothing says the government's plan is reliant on public approval. It could be that the government of Tomi is, uh, you know, an absolute despot who just rules by decree all the time and has decreed mongooses and doesn't really care what the public thinks. All right. The public's hanging out around trash cans, getting bitten by rats anyway. Maybe they're not the best judge of these things. So, C's not really looking good. D, of course, brings in a comparison. Poison traps are a more efficient manner of exterminating rats than our mongooses. Might be good. Gives us something other than mongooses we can use, but isn't good. Really, it's down to B and E. E in their native habitat, mongooses hunt and feed from dawn to dusk. Now, Kartik said something really important before. The argument mentions that the rats are nocturnal. Okay. That means that this dawn to dusk time frame actually directly touches on something in the argument. And that's pretty important. One, because if we're comparing it to B, run somewhat smaller than rats and dawn to dusk both kind of touch on things in the argument, but what the mongooses do in their native habitat with regards to time of day hunting is probably more likely to be carried over to a new habitat than what the mongoose feeds on in its natural habitat, which could be subject to all sorts of things. All right. Two e is good because, of course, A, C, and D all touch on things that simply are not in the argument and are not salient to the argument, though D can be a little bit misleading. In this case, it turns out the answer is E. The fact that they do feed on rodents somewhat smaller than rats in their natural habitats can go both ways. It's somewhat ambiguous, right? One, it's good news that they feed on rodents, rats are rodents, and so they may be willing to transfer those skills over to rats in this new exciting adventure that these mongooses are unwillingly embarking on, right? Two, it could just be that their native environment doesn't contain a rat-like thing for them to eat. Maybe they'd prefer a rat-like thing, like thing. Maybe they'd love to get a bigger meal in every kill. We don't know. And while B could be used, as justification for the position that this plan will fail, it's not going to be as strong or as direct as E is, all right? 
C falls into a classic trap. We're going to talk about what kinds of traps these answers represent um, in just a minute. But essentially, bringing in this new stuff, not all that relevant, or at least its relevance is hugely questionable. But something that people miss a lot in questions that have an if condition, right? That happens in the question prompt here, that the government's plan, if carried out, will not have its intended effect. People tend to like weakeners, and nobody here did. Well done, you guys. People tend to like weakeners that try to subvert that condition. Well, maybe the government's plan won't be carried out. That's fine. But the thing we're trying to weaken is not that the whether the government's plan will be carried out or not, but rather the proposition that the government's plan, if we assume it's carried out, will have its intended effect. C misses that point. D does a similar thing. Suggesting a better plan doesn't really speak to whether the government's plan will have its intended effect or not. It just kind of speaks to whether the government's plan is the best plan. But nobody said we had to weaken the proposition that the government's plan was the best plan. D is out. And E. Mongooses, diurnal or nocturnal or crepuscular habits are unlikely to change immediately, right? Those sorts of things, and this is meant to be somewhat common knowledge, as implied by the fact that the argument mentions rats are nocturnal, right? They're counting on you to know what nocturnal means here. But this is behavioral patterns that basically take a while to change. And so the fact that the mongooses will be showing up here hunting from dawn to dusk when the rats are active at night is at least a good reason to believe the mongooses are not really suited to the job, right? They're going to be out looking for rats when the rats are hidden away, sleeping their days away, dreaming of biting humans at garbage cans late at night. All right. Yeah, Carol, really, really good point. Um, comparisons are serious traps on the GMAT, and that's the last thing I want to talk about here, actually. Um, Depeche, to your question, if we didn't have option E, B would be absolutely the best answer there, because it's at least the only one suggestive besides E of the fact that maybe mongooses are not suited to the job. It's just that B leaves a bit too much open, right? It's, there are too many... Um, there are too many arguments that could be made off the back of B, whereas E doesn't allow as many arguments to be made. So that happens sometimes. In really hard questions, you might get an answer that's only as good as B and have to pick it. And in hard questions, you'll often get an answer that feels pretty good as B does early on, so that you're kind of attached to B at that point, and then give you a better answer later on, one that's more direct or a bit more inescapable than B, but at that point, they've already sold you on B a little bit, and so it's going to be hard to say, well, actually, E's a bit better. And I think that's a huge part of the trap in critical reasoning. They do like to put right answers toward the end in harder questions a lot of the time because they can then sell you on all their trap answers or at least get you all turned around with the trap answers along the way. Um, it's not that the rule-out logic doesn't apply to E. It's that the rule-out logic is a little bit harder to apply to E, right? Um, <clears throat> again, part of the new information in B says that the mongoose feeds on rodents, which actually, if you look at that, is pretty promising for using them to feed on rats, which are rodents, right? Granted, it says somewhat smaller, and that could be kind of a bad thing, but again, there are so many other assumptions that would need to be made, like the mongoose can only feed on rodents that are somewhat smaller, and it's not just a question of what they have available to them in their natural habitat would be the biggest one, right? Now, you might try to apply that same thing to E, that mongooses can only feed from dawn to dusk. Only that is, again, a more fixed kind of behavioral pattern. And yeah, that relies on some outside knowledge, as critical reasoning often does. But at least in the direct contrast between dawn to dusk and rats are nocturnal creatures, you have some basis for it in the argument, right? Rodents that are somewhat smaller than rats, even the somewhat kind of makes it seem like, well, somewhat smaller than rats. Is that like 10% smaller than rats? We might, might be able to transfer those skills, right? Mongooses, get it together and hunt those rats. So it's just essentially that, again, B has more objections you can lob against it or requires a bit more of a far-reaching assumption to make work. All we really have to assume in E is that animals' behavioral patterns, you know, nocturnal versus diurnal, will be slow to change. And I think that's a somewhat fair assumption, again, given that rats are just characterized as nocturnal creatures up there, and the mongoose is now characterized as feeding from dawn to dusk. Um, it is indeed a characteristic of animals, right? And yeah, they could maybe change their stripes, as it were. There's a later mongoose question that we might get to that talks about stripes. 
Um, but it seems much more likely um, in the real world even, which again is where critical reasoning lives. It's not like reading comprehension where we shouldn't be adding anything outside. In the real world, it seems much more likely that mongooses will transfer their rodent hunting skills from a somewhat smaller target to a somewhat larger topic or target more easily than that they'll suddenly change their entire living pattern from hunting and feeding at day to hunting and feeding at night, right? We as humans can probably appreciate that, <laughs> though, goodness knows, I will hunt and feed at night if I need to, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, look, Manishwar, I think that to that point, again, behavioral patterns um, tend to like, you know, you can even take an animal in captivity, right, who's never actually been in its natural habitat, and it will tend to be nocturnal if the, you know, species itself is nocturnal in its natural habitat. Whereas, you can also tend to take a species in captivity and feed it weird things that it wouldn't necessarily feed on in the real world, because maybe it wouldn't even have access to them. Frozen mice to snakes, for instance, that sort of thing. Yes, this still requires a bit of outside knowledge, but I think the contrast between dawn to dusk and nocturnal is still a much stronger contrast than the contrast between rodents somewhat smaller than rats and rodents somewhat larger than those rodents, right? Like, that's just a small difference of degree, whereas nocturnal and dawn to dusk is literally night and day. And my, maybe that's the best way to look at it, that E offers kind of an opposing contrast, whereas B just offers a contrast in degree, All right? A lot of ways to break this down, but again, that's the sort of thing we run into in hard questions. And by the way, part of the reason we're doing this back-end answer choice analysis, what's actually wrong with the wrong answers, what's right with the right answer, is this is exactly the way you want to wrestle with answer choices in critical reasoning after you've done a question. Try on your own steam, before you look at an explanation, before you look at the many forum posts about it in GMAT Club, try to come up with your own reason why the wrong ones are wrong and the right one is right in words. And if you find out you got it wrong, you find out, okay, I picked B, but the answer is E, try one more time at that point before you look at explanations to say, okay, here's what I think the explanation might say in defense of E and might say against B. Moreover, when you're reviewing questions on the back end, it's a really good idea to try to identify common traps, right? The more you can do that, the more you'll see certain kinds of trap answers one, that you're vulnerable to and so can try to forestall, and two, that transfer from question to question so you can start noticing the patterns in critical reasoning, which can be really hard for something like critical reasoning and reading comprehension because it always feels like every argument is new, it's a different context, every passage is new and it's a different context. It turns out there's only so much they can do to make a wrong answer feel right. And the better you can identify those traps by name, the better prepared you're going to be to deal with them. All right. To that point, A. A fits into that trap answer category in which basically it starts off really strong. And if it had ended before this year, if it had just put a full stop after rats, A is great. And they know, test maker knows, that people are going to read a lot of A and then being already a bit sold on it, maybe not pay a huge amount of attention to the end. If you do that, you're doomed in the one wrong phrase answers or one word wrong answers, okay? It's kind of a microcosm of what we talked about in the grander answer choices, that they can put very tempting trap answers early in the answer choices, put a right answer later in the answer choice, and know that they'll already have drawn people off with that tempting trap answer. A is doing that on a smaller scale, putting a lot of tempting information up front, then hitting you with one ending phrase that's not quite right, then hoping you'll either forgive that phrase or not even really seriously read that phrase because you've already bought into A at that point. All right. B, we talked about needs an extra assumption or in comparison to E, a difference of degree. Um, e is more directly opposed to something said in the argument, whereas B, again, difference in degree. C, negates a condition, right? Whenever the conclusion says, if this holds true, you don't want an answer that says, well, it won't hold true. You're just going and living in the world in which that does hold true. Just like in data sufficiency, if it starts with an if statement, you have to accept that if statement as totally true throughout the problem. Same thing in critical reasoning. There's a lot of overlap between data sufficiency and critical reasoning. C also needs the extra assumption that government cares what the public thinks. All right. D, classic trap answer, the what about blank trap answer, right? Like, what about poison traps? Now, 
If the argument had said importing mongooses is the only way to solve this problem, or importing mongooses is the best way to solve this problem, then D is looking pretty legit. But the argument didn't say that. The argument just wants us to judge whether the government's plan will have its intended effect, not whether it's the best plan or the only plan that'll work or anything like that. And so D's what about poison traps doesn't really come into play. As Carol says, comparison answers, unnecessary or irrelevant comparison answers are really tempting wrong answer choices um, in both reading comprehension and critical reasoning. And they can be right sometimes. You just have to have a certain kind of conclusion to make them right. And I think that's what makes them more tempting, that they are, in fact, right answers in some questions. And it's really a nuanced difference in the argument that tells you whether this is appropriate to the conclusion or not. All right. And there we go. Let's go on to some more tactics. Let's talk negation test, y'all. All right. For the negation test, oh, there's so many good ones here, but we're going to have a look at this argument right here. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know what the negation test is. The basic principle of the negation test is that if you negate the correct answer in a find the assumption question, you'll turn it into a weakener that is virtually inescapable. The conclusion stands little to no chance of being correct. Now that still requires a strong focus on the conclusion and it means that assumption questions can be kind of turned into weakened questions, which are in some cases more natural for people. We just saw a weakened question on the fence about how natural it is, okay? So what I'd advocate is this. First, read the argument as you would, break it down into premise and conclusion, and again, strong focus on the conclusion. Now, in an assumption question in a straight ahead fashion, you're looking for the answer that must be true for the conclusion to even stand a chance, an answer that is necessary to the conclusion's success. Not necessarily sufficient to the conclusion's success, but necessary. But again, one of the best ways to test whether an answer is really necessary here is to negate it, either add not to it or some kind of negative particle to it, or remove a negative particle that's already there from it, and then hold it up to the conclusion. See if it weakens that conclusion, okay? Again, I'll give you a minute with this, maybe two, and see what answers you favor. Keep up the good work, everybody. All right, we have some answers coming in and keep them coming. 
We're going to talk about what makes this particular argument so hard in just a minute. Wait for a few more answers. I'm just going to say that I love that a user named Dub C picked C. I think you don't even have a choice at that point. You have to do it. Just like I have to pick an answer named Star anytime it comes up. All right. All right. We look like we've got a strong favorite emerging in A. We've been wrong before, but Kartik hasn't. So I'm inclined to trust. Okay, keep those answers coming in, but I'm gonna to start to speak to what makes this particular argument so difficult, all right? What makes this argument so difficult is the conclusion and the correct answer are very referential, which is to say, this question's testing inference skills alongside assumption skills. And the more an argument requires you to make inferences, which is to say to make connections between disparate elements in the argument, the harder it tends to be. Also, assumptions and inference or draw conclusion questions often feel very similar and often do require overlapping skills. So this isn't a surprise, but it does tend to happen in harder assumption questions this way. How so? Well, the conclusion is the last sentence, right? Dehumidifying the environment to minimize dampness will allow these rare books to be stored without risking damage from paper lice. Sweet. But why? What does dehumidifying the environment to minimize dampness have to do with it? There's nothing that says that paper lice care about damp environments versus dry environments, right? And that's because this thing about dehumidifying the environment is a callback to damp areas in the first sentence, right? We find out that this certain fungus grows primarily in damp areas. And so dehumidifying the environment, which is to say making the environment not damp, we can infer will prevent the fungus from growing, right? Or is intended at least to prevent the fungus from growing, right? That in turn presumably means that the fungus won't create microscopic spores and that the paper lice will have nothing to feed on. And that seems to be the connection they're going for. They're connecting the dampness of the environment to paper lice, but there are a couple of steps along that path. And that's what I mean when I talk about a very inferential conclusion. You have to connect the dots yourself to understand where this conclusion even comes from, given the premises, right? Okay. Now, the conclusion itself is that dehumidifying the environment will allow these things to be stored without risking damage from paper lice. Um, and given one of the trap answers that's proved pretty popular here, I will refer you guys to a very kind of long-standing official guide question about sulfites in wines, which has a very similar trap answer to one that's getting a lot of people here and um, has a very similar conclusion that precludes that trap answer. More on that later. First, let's acknowledge new information in all the answers. There is absolutely new information in all the answers, right? Um, prevented from entering is something that A talks about that the argument never really talks about. It just says dehumidifying the environment will make sure it's, you know, stored without risking damage from paper lice. It didn't say sealing them in lice-proof chambers or something like that. So prevented from entering might be new information we don't necessarily need. We've got a comparative answer in B more significant damage, right? We've talked about fungus being eliminated in C, which the conclusion never really talked about, nor did the argument, and then talk about spores remaining, right? Eliminated and remaining are kind of the new elements of C. D talks about the pages becoming brittle and cracking. Dry environment was definitely in the argument. Storing rare books, definitely in the argument, but causing the pages to become brittle and crack, that's new stuff. And then E, talks explicitly about other insects, right? Um, the argument talks about paper lice, but maybe other insects are something to worry about. That's what E would put forth, all right? Now, 
the negation test. All right. Again, the method is add negativity or remove negativity to see which one becomes a really inescapable weakener for the conclusion that's explicitly there. Not a gist conclusion or anything like that, right? A, you'd have to insert a knot. Paper lice cannot be prevented from entering an area that is being dehumidified. Now, if that's the case, does that ruin the conclusion? Not necessarily, because again, the conclusion wasn't contingent on preventing paper lice from entering. By inference, the conclusion was contingent on eliminating the fungus, eliminating the spores, and so not giving the paper lice any reason to be in the books, right? Um, it would be nice if paper lice could be prevented from entering an area that's being dehumidified. That would add some strength to this whole plan, but it is not something that is necessary to this plan. And that's right there, the difference between a strengthener and an assumption It is very common to see a strengthen answer as one of the trap answers in an assumption question, because they are very similar. All assumptions strengthen the argument, but not all strengtheners are assumptions. The question is, is this necessary? If negated, is this inescapable? All right. For the rest of the answers, treating rare books with insecticide will not cause more significant damage than that caused by paper lice. Hard to say. I mean, we've already kind of ruled out treating these books with insecticide anyway, so this is a little bit out of scope, regardless of whether it will or will not cause more significant damage. And the question is still, will this plan work? Will dehumidifying the environment prevent damage from paper lice or no? Which means B, kind of like some answers in the last one, is missing the point a little bit. In fact, it's just like the comparison answer from the last one about the poison traps. Missing the point. We don't need this comparison to judge whether this plan is going to work as intended, right? C, we can remove the negativity from, right? So we'd read it as, after the fungus has been eliminated, fungal spores remain in significant quantity. You don't really have to take out the any, it's just kind of awkward to leave it there. Does that ruin the argument? Well, again, by inference, fungal spores are what the paper lice feed on, according to the first sentence, right? These microscopic spores. And so if the fungus has been eliminated by dehumidifying the environment and not giving it a chance to live there, but fungal spores remain in significant quantities, then we'd have every reason to believe that paper lice are going to be there too. Paper lice weren't there for the fungus, they were there for the spores. And as long as the spores are there, they presumably will be too, which means C looks like a pretty strong weakener for this particular conclusion. You're the one to beat, see? Indeed, it's not possible to store books in a dry environment without causing the pages to come brittle and crack. Now, that's pretty tempting too, and I know it took a lot of people in, right? Because it makes it seem like, well, these books are doomed then if we go through with this plan, right? So we're dehumidifying the environment, now the environment's dry, and D's adding to that, it's not possible to store books in a dry environment without brittleness and cracking, right? However, that does not actually change the truth of the conclusion because the conclusion was not dehumidifying the environment will save these books from all damage. Had it been, D would be a great answer. The conclusion was only limited to dehumidifying the room in which these books are stored will prevent damage from paper lice, not prevent all other damage. And so D falls into this classic trap of not respecting the specificity of the conclusion. <clears throat> all right. It's a gist answer. It's a close but no cigar conclusion answer, right? And these ones are among the most tempting. This and E are actually the ones that kind of call back to that sulfites in wines question from the official guide. And again, I highly recommend you check that one out for a very similar dynamic in some of the trap answers. And indeed, E, aside from paper lice, other insects typically feed on the paper used to create books would be great if we had said that these books will be safe from all harm, but that's not what the conclusion promised, just that they'd be safe from damage from paper lice. And so, E, when negated, is still kind of irrelevant to this conclusion. Here it all is. C ends up being the one, because C is the only one, when negated, that gives us a strong reason to believe these books will still be tempting for paper lice to come and feast on, right? And again, it does so by very subtle inferential means. You have to connect a lot of dots to make this one work. It's one of the hardest things in critical reasoning questions, all right? And a pretty good example of a sort of double move, um, a case in which 
you do have to take what's said, make one more inference, and then be in a position to judge the argument accordingly. All right. <clears throat> Hard. It's a hard difficulty question. I chose these questions actually after going to GMAT Club where, as you guys will likely know, they put a rating for each question. And <laughs> I chose the brand new, the recently unveiled 800 plus level difficulty question. So take that as you will. This is a very hard question. Um, it is a lot like the sulfites and wines question, but harder, honestly, because of all the inference that needs to happen here to make this one work. All right. So, yeah, very difficult. Sorry, but also not sorry. Because it's what we're here for, right? <clears throat> okay. Notice, Deepesh, the problem you got into was putting from paper lice in brackets as though it was less important than the rest of it. If it's in the conclusion, you got to trust that every phrase is, like, at least viable as an important phrase, right? You don't want to kind of neglect anything, especially anything specific or anything related to the premises, which paper lice definitely were, right? And we had an answer that spoke to the paper lice threat. That's going to be a better answer than answers that speak to other threats. So watch out for that bracketing. All right. All right. Next up, the double move. And we'll go through this one fairly quickly. It also gives us a chance to talk about strengthen questions. All right, this one is adapted from, again, an 800 plus level difficulty question that was in its original form an assumption question. Okay, take a look at it and see what you think. I'll wait for a couple answers before I go into it. All right, got a few answers coming in now and still here for more. It looks like a real C to D showdown. All right, good, excellent. Love what you guys are putting out there. Love to have your opinions on these things. That's what we're here for. 
All right. <clears throat> First off, prephrase would not be a bad idea, right? It often is a good idea. Um, put it in terms of the argument. What do we want an answer to accomplish? The idea would be sending contacts, lists of items similar to previous purchases will make gift purchasing easier for the original customer, right? Which is still kind of a mouthful, but at least you want it kind of summarized in that way or something similar, right? We want something that helps us believe that sending contacts these lists of items will make gift purchasing easier. Get ready for the double move. All right, so what we usually need to do in strengthen and weaken questions is a bit of consequence analysis, right? If this is the case, then what would the consequence be? And does that consequence in turn have the right impact on the conclusion that we're looking to support or weaken or whatever it may be? C's, D's, and E's are in it now, but D looks like the winner. Okay, cool. We'd of course want to acknowledge all the new information, right? Familiar with most or all other items, prefer receiving novel gifts, etc. right? And then we want to judge the answers by those bits of new information. So if the customers are familiar with most or all of the items in stock, then what would you expect? In the real world, and again, this is a very real world process. For critical reasoning, it often is. Presumably, if they're familiar with all available items and they wanted a different item, they would have already bought it, right? It couldn't be due to lack of familiarity. And so, I don't know, if I knew somebody knew about all the items I was considering getting them as a gift and chose not to buy those items, then it's probably not going to make for great gift giving, right? Also, the argument's just not contingent on whether they know about all the items or not. The argument is contingent on whether their contacts know about the items to get them. Nicely done. Um, I will say up front, a lot of you are right this time. Great job. By and large, they prefer to receive novel gifts that are unlike the items. This is absolutely a weakener, an opposite answer. Classic trap on strengthen and weaken. And almost every strengthen and weaken question, you'll have at least one answer that does the opposite of the job. And they can be really tempting because they're at least in scope. They just go in the wrong direction. Though, I will say, be tempted. Nobody here. It was all C, D, and E. See, few if any of them use retail websites primarily to purchase gifts for others. So if they were to use the retail websites primarily to purchase gifts for others, the idea is then their purchase histories wouldn't actually reflect items that they're interested in, which means using their purchase histories to give gift giving ideas for them won't actually work. But this thing's saying the opposite is true. And that right there is the double move. In strengthened questions, the double move shows up a lot. And the way it basically works is you almost have to pass through a weakener to understand why it's a strengthener, right? <clears throat> if they don't use websites to purchase gifts for others, then it's very likely that they're using the website to purchase things for themselves, not things for others. And so their history will be pretty reflective of things they want, but it is much easier to process, or at least much more natural, I think, to process C as a weakener. What if the opposite were true? That would be bad for this plan. So C is probably a pretty decent strengthener. Not so different from the negation test in assumption questions. And that's what makes the double move so hard. You don't usually benefit from the negation test in strengthened questions. But I often find if I look at the five answers and I'm like, none of these seems to be really relevant, which happens to me in strengthened questions above all, then the negation test can often really help in those questions to see which one turns into at least a bit of a weakener. C is the one, and um, Dipesh said this, I think, really well in the chat window. D was the most tempting wrong answer, and it's a really subtle one, okay? Like, on some level, you almost have to assume that they don't mind their histories being shared with other people. The subtlety here is... Their retail purchase histories are actually not shared with other people, right? According to the argument, this is all done without revealing the specifics of a customer's purchase history, which moves D into irrelevant territory, but not for lack of trying to seem relevant, all right? D is a really good trap answer in that way. Now, how do you avoid falling into a trap like D? Sometimes it's necessary to take keywords from the argument and make sure you link them up, or from the answer choice rather, and make sure you link them up to the argument. Relatively unconcerned is new information here. That might be important, but 
is this a situation that the plan is proposing? Not necessarily. And the plan had so many ins and outs that it is a good idea to at least go up there and double check, especially if you're, say, down to C and D, which I think is reasonable on the first pass through these answer choices. Then you have to go over each one with a finer tooth comb, try things like negation, try things like linking up specifics from the answer to the argument, and one of them is going to fail. But I think C versus D is kind of your like last round on this question. And as you will know, when you get better and better at critical reasoning and when the questions get harder and harder, you're often going to be down to two answers. And knowing what to do with those two answers is really important. Negation is one of those things. Consequential reasoning is one of those things. And making sure you link up key things to the argument is also one of the tactics you can use when you're down to two. You can't do it for all five answers. You don't have the time. But when you're down to two and really struggling, that could be a good time to do it. And of course, physical retail stores could kind of work, um, but only if you take it to its extreme, right? Like maybe even if they don't prefer retail shopping to in-person shopping, they do enough of it so that this plan will still work, right? Um, which means ease a little bit squishy, ease a little bit too neutral on this thing to serve as a really good strengthener. It is a bit suggestive of something that would be good to have, but not as much as C, which could potentially lead to a deal breaker if negated, all right? That's what it's about. Tricky indeed. Double move, strengthen questions are some of the trickiest ones. All right. Now, with that, you guys, we're pretty much going to end it. We are pretty much at time, but I did promise you something on hard, bold faced questions. And so I'm just going to put this out there. Hard, bold faced questions rely on all verbal skills. Critical reasoning skills, you have to find the conclusion to interpret everything else through the lens of the author's conclusion. Is it on the author's side, on the opposing side, supporting the conclusion, background not really related to the conclusion, etc. You benefit from reading comprehension skills. These are actually a lot like specific purpose or like the author mentions blank in order to questions. We need to know what the purpose of each of these boldface questions is. And to determine that both on the reading comprehension side and on the critical reasoning side, depends a lot on key transition words. But for example, however, um, in that respect, further, as is the case here before the second boldface portion. And funny enough, hard boldface questions benefit a lot from sentence correction skills, specifically in comparing the answers to each other, right? Because these were the answers, and we're not going to do this one. We're about out of time. But notice that like, they all start with the first is a blank, most of them go on to say that blank, right? And the second is a blank, that blank. And you can judge each answer by comparing little pieces of those answers to each other. Now, I wouldn't usually say start with generalization versus pattern versus phenomenon. I would much more be inclined to say start with that the author aims to attack versus that the author acknowledges as true or with the second part. But that comparative skill you use in sentence correction all the time really helps on boldface questions, all right? And with that, I'm going to end it. One more shout out to GMAT Club. GMAT Club, thanks for hosting these things. We love to do them. And I know, hopefully, you students benefit from them as well. GMAT Club, such a good resource. Um, and don't forget, the MBA Fair is coming to GMAT Club on June 13th and 14th. Go to gmatclub.com and you will have right in front of your eyes a panoply of all the schools that are going to participate and... Other companies, ours included, Manhattan Prep, as well as a link to register. Do it. Be there. Ask the schools your questions. Come ask Manhattan Prep your questions. We'll be around for you. And anybody who's interested in any courses, there's a promo code. Use it. Love it. Be there. All right. With that, you guys, I will wish you a great rest of your day and or night. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you.